Joe of the Chalet School, Chapter 19, Joe Writes an Elsie Book Dr. Russell had been quite right when he said that Joe had made her own punishment. She had. For more than a week, she was stiff and aching from her bruises and her sprained ankle. While any movement was sheer agony for the first two or three days, like most excitable children, she developed a temperature very easily, and during those first nights she was quite light-headed, which might have alarmed her sister seriously had she not been accustomed to Joe. Then, when the worst of the bruises began to heal, and the throbbing in her ankle grew less, the young rebel became decidedly bored with life. Very little had been said to any of them about the ice carnival affair. Bernhilda, it is true, had scolded Frida roundly, and Wanda had followed her example with Marie and Paula. But the head had merely informed them that their behavior had shown that they were unworthy of the trust she had given them, and said that, for the present at any rate, they were to be treated like the juniors and always have someone in authority with them. This hurt, and the five left the study weeping bitterly. Miss Bettany had said very little, but what she had said was impressive, and they all wished they had never heard of such a thing as an ice carnival. As for Joey, the leader of it all, there was, of course, no need to watch her. She had to stay in bed. The other girls were not allowed to visit her except at very long intervals, and she was thoroughly bored. I wish there were some fresh books to read, she sighed one day. The doctor happened to be with her at the time. Find it dull, he asked. Duller than dull. I wouldn't mind so much if I only had something to read, but I haven't. I've read all the books in the library and I'm tired of them. Dr. Jim, can't you lend me something? Dr. Jim, he had told her to call him this, chuckled. As a matter of fact, I can, he said. Ever read the Elsie books? No, but I have often heard of them, replied Joe. Aren't they about an awfully good little girl, and aren't there dozens of them? But how in the world do you know about anything about Elsie books, demanded Madge, who was sitting beside Joey. I picked them up in a cheap, all-sorts shop, explained the doctor. There are six or seven, I believe. I've heard one of my aunts talking about them once and lamenting that she had lost her copies, so I thought she'd appreciate them. Anyway, I'll fetch them along sometime. At least they'll be something fresh. Jolly, said Joe. It is decent of you, Dr. Jim. It was as good as he was as good as his word. During the afternoon, Marie trotted up the stairs with a parcel of books, which she gave the delighted Joe, who spread them out on the bed in front of her and feasted her eyes on them. There were six of them. Elsie Dismore, Elsie's Holiday, Elsie's Girlhood, Elsie's Womanhood, Elsie's Motherhood, and Elsie's Children. Madge, coming upstairs an hour later, found her fathoms deep in the first and felt thankful. For the rest of the week, Joey reveled in the deeply pious atmosphere of Elsie and her companions. Many names in the book she had no idea of what they were, and she would ask Madge about American history. At length, the sorely tired sister struck and vowed she would answer no more. Read up your history if you want to know, she cried. Well, get me some more books, then, please, replied Joey. I'd like one on the War of Independence and the Pilgrim Fathers and the Civil War. Oh, and an atlas to find places. Where's Fort Sumter? And why did it fall uh, at the start of the war? And Madge flew before the storm, and Joey was left with a half-finished question on her tongue. But presently Frida trotted in with two or three books of general history and a big atlas. Madame sends these, she announced. Do you require anything else, Joey? For I will bring it. Joey considered. Yes, you can bring me some paper reams of it and some blotchy. Oh, and my fountain pen. Do you mind, Frida? You are a sport. Frida brought her what she wanted, and when Miss Bettany came up the afternoon, she found Joey propped up against her pillows, and a pile of sheets covered her 
irregular writing on the bed beside her. Well, said her elder sister, what are you busy with now? Joey raised an excited face to her. Oh, Madge, I'm writing an Elsie book. What? Morals? Texts and all? inquired Madge, choking back a laugh. She had glanced through one of the books and knew their type. No, said Joe reluctantly. I don't know enough texts. I see. How much have you done, Joey? Just the first three chapters, replied Joey. I'm calling it Elsie's Boys, and it's all about the boys, Eddie and Harold and Herbert. Don't start writing again. It's getting too dark to see, and you'll strain your eyes if you go on. Well, can't I have the light on then? pleaded Joey. Mad shook her head. No, not yet. Lie still and rest. You'll overtire yourself if you don't, and then you won't be able to get up tomorrow. Get up? Am I going to get up? Oh, how gorgeous! Dr. Russell is coming to carry you down to my study in the morning, and you are to lie on the couch there. Herr Arnsrill will be here for the day. We'll bring you back here at the end of the afternoon. Magnificent, announced Joe with a sigh. I was getting sick of this room. It's your own fault you're here, replied Madge. I'm not going to lecture now. You've had your punishment, and fairly severe one, too. Past things are past, but I do want you to realize that it isn't playing the game to grumble at consequences. Then she changed the subject, and that was all Joey heard about her escapade. The next day, as soon as Dr. Jem had left her comfortably arranged on the couch so that she could see out of the window into the garden, she demanded her book and went on with undiminished ardor. As long as it was advisable to keep her quiet, Madge was thankful that she could employ herself so happily, but Monday of the next week found her back in schoolroom, settled in an invalid's chair, manufactured out of an ordinary one, and some wood, so that she could keep her sprained ankle up. She was glad enough to be back with the others, but it was a fearful nuisance not to be able to go on with her writing. Every spare moment she had was devoted to it, and piles of exercise papers containing the doings of the Trevelia boys grew daily larger. Even so, however, she found it difficult to get on as quickly as she would have liked. Then came doubts about it. It was sure to be full of mistakes. It was stupid. At this juncture, Madge unconsciously came to the rescue. When are you going to let me see that story of yours? She demanded one day. Isn't it finished yet? No, not exactly, faltered Joey. Her sister looked at her amazedly. May I see it, Joey? She asked. Joey mutely held out the bundle, and her sister gasped at its eyes. Why, Joe, it's quite a book, she cried. Madge went off to her own den with the manuscript. It was some hours before she would get time to look at it. Joe's writing was not her strong point, and parts of the book were almost illegible. Her punctuation was shakily, and her spelling frequently verged on the phonetic. But, for all that... The story was surprisingly good. The characters in it were alive, and the young author showed a decided gift for description. Dr. Jim dropped in casually, as he often did now, and demanded that a chapter should be read to him. So after some deliberation, Madge selected her chapter and began to read. Madge! Joey stood before them. Oh, how mean of you! How could you! Madge lifted amazed eyes to the flushed face above her. Why, Joe, she began. The doctor stopped her. Joey, it was my fault. I very much wanted to see what you had made of it. So I asked Miss Bettany to read it to me. I'm the one for whom you should be angry. But I hope you aren't going to be angry. The flush died out of Joe's face, and she looked at him in a puzzled way. I don't see why you want to read it, she said slowly. Madge is different. Madge is my sister. Why did you want to see it? Because, said the doctor, I had read your fairy tale in the Shalitian. It was very pretty. But any ordinary clever girl might have imagined it. 
though she would not have expressed it in quite your way, that I grant you. This is a totally different thing, and I wanted to see how you would tackle it. Even the little I had heard has told me that what I wanted to know. You can vary your style to suit your subject, and that is a very great thing in story writing. It's early to prophesy. You are only how old? Thirteen, is it? Joey nodded. She hadn't taken her eyes off of his face once, and Madge was listening with the same tense eagerness. The doctor looked at them. You are very young, Joey, but I'm going to take it upon myself to prophesy after all. If you go on as you have begun, and work hard at grammar and literature and all your other lessons, then one day you will write something really worth while. Do, do you really mean that? she asked in a breathless sort of way. Really? Yes, I mean it. It will be hard work, Joey, and hard work all the time. But if you go on, you will do it. There was a little silence in the room, and then Joe, the undemonstrative, suddenly flung her arms round the doctor's neck and gave him a vigorous hug. Oh, oh, Dr. Jem, I love you, she gasped. Madge, I will work, and I'll be an angel of goodness at my lessons. She released the doctor and collapsed into her sister's arms. Madge, you silly child, Madge scolded her gently. You mustn't get so excited, Joey. Yes, come in, as a tap sounded at the door. Gisela Marini appeared. Excuse me, madame, but Miss Maynard wished to know if Joey had told you that Papa is here, as he has to hurry back and would be glad to see you if you can spare him the time. Madge looked at Joe speechless. I quite forgot. Chapter 20 Joey and Rufus to the Rescue January had faded into February before Grizel returned to school. She was a somewhat subdued Grizel, for her grandmother had died only the week before she came back, and the long days spent in the old lady's room had helped to soften a certain hardness in her character. She had also come back full of the girl guide movement. A company had begun in the high school which she and Joey and Rosalie had attended when living in England, and most of the members of their old form had joined. Grizel, always interested in anything new, had learned all she could about the guides, and she was very keen for Madge to start a company in the chalet school. Mr. Cochran had brought his small daughter two of the handbooks, Girl Guiding and Girl Guide Badges and How to Win Them, as well as half a dozen storybooks on the same subject. She lent them all round among the seniors and middles in her desire to make the others happy about it. Many of the badges appealed to them. Living in a mountainous district where ropes were in constant use, they saw the value of learning the various knots, the making of fires in the open, as well as cooking and housewifery knowledge, and demanding for many of the tests seemed matter of course to girls whose mothers did a great deal of housekeeping and house caring themselves the nursing tests did not appeal to them quite so much but the arts and crafts they hailed with joy wanda wanted to take arts badges and gisla felt a yearning for basket workers and embroiderers joey plumped for book lovers and authors the upshot of all this was that finally a deputation waited on the head in her study and begged that she would let them start a guide company. Miss Betney surveyed them consideringly. Why? she asked. It's such a fine thing, madame, said Grizel eagerly. It bucks you up and makes you smart. Also, I like the idea of learning to do many useful things, added Gisela. It appears to me that to be a guide makes one also capable of much. "'And it will make for oneness,' put in Juliet. "'That is a thing.' "'Miss Betney nodded. "'Yes, Juliet, you're right. "'A sense of unity is one of the biggest things in life. "'So is all-round neatness and smartness, "'but the guide movement seems to me to hold everyone more than that. "'It gives you a big outlook "'and strengthens one's ideas of playing the game and being straight, "'and those are very big ideas, indeed. "'Will you help us?' 
asked Grizel. May we have a company? Yes, replied the head. I had intended to speak to you about it before we broke up, which we do in three weeks. So it is only anticipating things a little. We cannot do anything much about it this term, I'm afraid. You must all work up for your tenderfoot badges, and you can begin to learn m Morse for second class. Next term will begin in real earnest. There was a little pause. Madge could see that the girls wanted to ask her something else, but they had felt shy about it. What else? she asked, looking straight at Gisla. Will, will you be our captain, madame? said the head girl in response to the look. We would wish if you would. Miss Bettany flushed with pleasure. I should like to be your captain, she said quietly. Joey and I are going to England for the holidays, and I hope to be able to go to an instruction course for guiders while we are there. It will be difficult for me to get training otherwise, I'm afraid. By the way, Joe does not know of my arrangements. Will you please say nothing to her till I give you permission? I would not have told you, but you see, you have rather forced my hand. She smiled at them and then dismissed them to go and tell the others that it was all right, and they were going to have their guide company. But what about us? demanded Amy Stevens. We can't be guides, cause we're not eleven yet. You can be brownies, if madame can get someone to be your brown owl, replied Grizel, finishing rather doubtfully. Probably Miss Maynard or Miss Durant will do that, suggested Juliet. I say, it's half past five, and we ought to be at prep. Silence presently reigned over the big classroom, where thirteen people sat struggling with algebra and French essays and history, and Juliet, the duty prefect, sitting with them, striving to prove that something complicated in comic sections. Joey Bettany taking a peculiar attempt at a simultaneous equation up to her for explanation, Thank goodness that she hadn't such awful things to work out. She hated mathematics and considered equations of all kinds an ingenious form of girl torture. Juliet, who was mathematically inclined, was rather horrified at the muddle Joey had made and set to work painstakingly to help her to unravel it. Joe listened to her explanation with about half an ear, and then, having said she understood went back to her seat, proceeded to make confusion worse confounded, which resulted in her work being ruined the next day, so that she was kept in after Mittagensen to have an algebra lesson to herself while the others went out for a romp along the edge of the lake. Before the younger Miss Bettany fully understood what she was supposed to have done, both she and Miss Maynard were hot and weary. Finally, the pupil remarked that she loathed maths. "'Because you can't do them, or rather won't try,' replied Miss Maynard scathingly. "'Take your book back to your desk and work out the example, and the next correctly.' Joey took her untidy exercise book back to her desk and flounced down on her chair with a scowl that said that she daren't speak loud. Miss Maynard ignored her little exhibition of temper and went on with her corrections. It was a glorious March day outside. The sun was shining brightly, and the fresh wind was blowing the cobwebs away. There was no hope of being left off. Joey knew that very well. She heaved a deep sigh and returned to the X and Y. Finished? asked Miss Maynard, looking up for a moment. Not quite, said Joey truthfully. Hurry up then. Ten minutes steady work will do it. Joe heaved another sigh and then suddenly gave up the struggle. She went at it. Twenty minutes later, she was racing along the lake path like a mad thing, her coat flailing open and her hair tossing wildly in the wind. Grizel joined her just opposite the Crom Prince Carl where already there was signs of activity and preparation for the coming season. Ooh, isn't that a gorgeous day, Joey gazed round her rapturously. I love the winter here, but it's been 
deadly dull since the snow melted. I must say, I think thaws are the most boring things imaginable. Let's join the others over there, shall we? They walked along towards the little rivulet, which acted as the outlet of the mountain streams. In the summer, it was rarely more than a trickle of clear water bubbling over the pebbly bed. There was nothing of the trickle about it today. The snows on the lower slopes of the mountains were melting rapidly, and a perfect torrent of gray rushing water fought its way between the narrow banks of the lake, whence the ice had melted, for the most part, through blocks of it still floating there and here. If that river rises much more, it'll flood, said Grizel, as they stood watching it for a moment. Look at those elders, Joey. They're nearly washed out. Not quite, though. Madge says they root pretty firmly, replied Joe. I suppose they have, or they wouldn't have been able to grow by the side of the river. What a noise the water makes, doesn't it? Come on, let's cross, said Grizel. Mr. Ant must be talking of something awfully jolly, to judge by the row, the row they're all making. Let's go and see what it is. They hurried down the path to the light plank bridge which crossed the stream. Grizel danced over without a thought, but Joey shut her eyes as she made the crossing. Why on earth, gasped her friend, Joey, why do you do that? The water makes me so giddy, replied Joey. I love the sound of it, but I do loathe to see it rushing along like that. It makes me feel all funny. Silly, said Grizel, a little contempt flavoring her tone. I can't help it. Joey flushed scarlet. It always does. It looks so, so cruel, as though it didn't care for anybody or anything. Oh, she concluded with a wild yell as Rufus leapt up against her. She was growing up into, he was growing up into a handsome dog, very big with enormous paws and a fine head, several pounds of excitable, St. Bernard puppy flung against her proved too much for Joe, and she sat down violently on the wet grass, Rufus rolling madly beside her, frantic with joy. Get up, Joey, began Grizel. Then she stopped as a scream of terror cut across her speech. There was a splash, then a little grunt from Joey, and the next minute she was tearing over the ground like a possessed creature, while Miss Durant, who had seen what had occurred, raced after her. The robin and two or three of the other juniors had been playing together with the paper dolls, which had been Simone's hobby during the previous term. Robin had brought them out with her today, and had been playing with them quite happily on some big stones of the little way on past the bridge. A sudden breeze had lifted one and drifted it slowly across the grass towards the water. The robin had run to catch it, and had forgotten to look where she was going and fallen headlong into the icy torrent that was raging down to the lake. It all happened so quickly that no one could reach her in time to save her, and it seemed as if she must be whirled down to the lake before any of them could prevent it. Mercifully, her coat caught for a moment on one of the elder trees, swept by the water, and this just gave Joey time to climb down a little in front of her, and then the coat gave way, and she was swept onwards. The current drove her into the bushes where Joe was waiting, and clinging to them with one hand, she stretched out and caught the baby's shoulder with the other. Then she set her teeth and held on. The racing water was frightfully near, and she was sick and giddy, and partly from terror, partly from watching that swirling torrent. But any idea of giving up was very far from her. She clung with all her might and main to the little shoulder and the bushes, wondering dully how long it would be before the elders would give under the strain and send them down with that wicked gray water that seemed to be coming higher and higher. It seemed hours to Joey, though actually it was barely two minutes, before there was a crash and a splash and Miss Durant was standing beside her, 
waist deep in water and lifting the robin with one arm comfortably round her while with the other hand she too held on to the bushes for the force of the snow fed torrent nearly took her off her feet strong big woman as she was hold on joey she said here come the others hold on then gisla and bernhilda bent down from the bank and between them took the unconscious robin from the young mistress miss durant promptly transferred her support to joey who found things fast becoming misty and unreal to her then there came fresh help as a huge tawny body plunged in and rufus caught his little mistress's skirt between his strong young teeth it was an easy matter after that for Miss Durant to scramble up the bank, still holding Joey with one hand, lest even Rufus' strength should prove unequal to the strain. After that, the world grew black, and Joey never knew what happened next. Of Miss Durant's laying down on her face and lifting her by degrees from the water, while Rufus tugged and scrambled up beside her, of the sudden appearance of Dr. Jim on the scene, and his picking her up and racing back to the chalet with her, of getting her wet clothes off and plunging her into a hot bath, she remembered nothing. She came back to the world with a hot, stinging taste on her tongue, a nasty taste, and the rough, hairy feeling of blankets next to her skin. Hello, she remarked. I say, what's up? All right, old lady. Lie still, said Dr. Jem's voice. Drink this like a good girl. Joe obediently swallowed it and spluttered. Ugh, what filthy stuff. Then she remembered. The robin. She gave a sharp cry. Quite safe, replied the doctor, snug in bed and fast asleep. Sure? Joe was growing drowsy. Certain. She's had a bit of a shock, of course, but she'll soon get over it. Now we're going to pack you off to bed. Come along. Joey felt him lift her up but she was too sleepy to think of anything. Her head dropped on the shoulder, and by the time she and an agitated Miss Maynard had her snugly tucked up in bed with hot bottles all round her and was lost to the world. She ought to be all right, murmured the doctor. We've been so quick. I'm in hopes that she may have escaped a cold. And the robin? queried Miss Maynard. She ought to do all right, too. She struck her head as she fell, as she was a bit stunned, and did take in the full horror of it. They may be a little con they may be a little concussion. I can't say yet, but otherwise there's no need of alarm, I hope. You said Miss Bettany and Mademoiselle had had to go to Sparts? Miss Maynard nodded. They went to get some things we needed. I see. Well, I'll go and meet them and break the news gently. Don't leave those two alone. You can send up the sensible head girl of yours. So it happened that half an hour later, Madge Bettany and Mademoiselle La Patre, climbing up the last bit of the mountain path, were met with a story of the latest doings of the chalet girls. They were horrified, but the doctor managed to calm their fears. He walked back with them before going off to the post, where he had been staying ever since the night of the ice carnival. And as he had predicted, neither Joey nor the robin was much the worse for their adventure. Joey woke with a bad headache, the result of the neat brandy he had made her swallow to stave off a cold, and robin had a lump of size of a pigeon egg on the top of her head and was inclined to be miserable and fractious for a day or two but otherwise they were both all right. The girls were tremendously thrilled over having a heroine in the school, and Rufus was in a fair way to be spoilt for his share in the business. The most discontented person in the school was Grizel. It's too bad, she moaned. If only our guide company had been formed, Joey would have been a guide, and then she might have had the silver cross for saving a life at the risk of her own, it's hard luck.